Welcome everyone to the Inclusion Conversation. This is episode nine already, um, and we're going to be talking about where is home, the path to belonging with two special guests. Really, really looking forward to this conversation. Um, before we get into it, I just wanted to introduce myself for those who don't know me. So my name is Solène Anglaret, and I'm the host uh, of the Inclusion Conversation. And I created this space because I wanted to break down borders and bring the world closer together one conversation at a time. And so every episode, we talk about different aspects, different elements of diversity and inclusion. And the aim really is to learn together. I'm really excited to be talking about home because it's a topic, it's a word that I've been reflecting on, writing about for many years. And so I'm really happy to be here with you today and explore it a little bit more. So how is this hour going to work? Um, so we have two parts. The first part is really a conversation with our guests with and Nimet. Um, and we're going to be half an hour, you know, just asking them questions, exploring this topic of home. And then we stop the recording after that. And we start um, diving together in this group into a conversation about home. So we'd love to hear, you know, what is home? Where is home to you after that in the second half hour? And that part isn't recorded. So we can literally say whatever we want. And for those watching the recording, you're definitely missing out. So join us for the first and the whole session next time. Uh, a little bit of the etiquette before we get into the conversation. So just a reminder, we are recording this first half. If you're comfortable, cameras on is amazing because it makes us feel like we're all talking to each other. Uh, obviously understand if you're not comfortable. The subtitles, closed captions are enabled and you can just request them through the button and then I'll just approve that. Um, there's the chat is open, so do say hi. We have a few new faces, um, so feel free to pop your name and where you're joining from in the chat, that would be lovely. Um, and then in terms of the mindset, I really just wanna remind everyone that um, topics around diversity and inclusion can be very personal. It can be very sensitive and sometimes triggering as well. So I just want to invite everyone to enter this space with a lot of kindness, a lot of respect and a lot of openness to learn. Uh, we won't have any breaks. So if you need one, just take one. You don't have to raise your hand, it's all good. So that's it for the little, little introduction. A really warm welcome to everyone. We are going to dive in, in into our questions, into our conversation with our guests. So we have Nimet and Philip who joined us today. So I will stop sharing my screen and we are going to be talking to them. So our first question really to get us started on this topic of, of home is a bit unusual right because usually you would introduce yourself first um but actually we're going to be asking you where were you born and what's your background so nimet if you want to get us started okay well thank you Solène, and thank you to everyone who's joined this conversation so i was born in uh, tanzania in east africa and um, a little about my background, uh, ethnically I'm Indian, and the three generations before I was born, my great, great, great grandparents crossed the Indian Ocean from India and settled in Tanzania. Amazing, what about you, Philip? Hi everyone, thank you for having me, Solene. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to discuss a very important topic as home. So my name is Philippe Zafirovsky and I'm originally from Macedonia. I come from the capital of the Republic of Macedonia, which is in the Balkans, a very small nation, a very small state. Um, I'm, I live currently in France, actually more specifically in Rennes, the capital of Brittany, but the region in France, Bretagne, Bretagne not Great Britain as many people would, would assume very often. Um, I'm ethnically only Macedonian when it comes to my origins, but in French Macedonian today when it comes to naturalization. I consider myself very often as the citizen of the world. So I feel that by traveling or living in different places, I think I have acquired certain elements of different cultures, although ethnically speaking and being in terms of um, my birthplace and so on, I'm uh, from Macedonia, from the Balkans. Thank you so much. And you've already told us where you live now. So Nimet, uh, what about you? Where do you live now? Well, right now I'm um, just outside of Lisbon in Portugal. And uh, my husband and I moved here just over a year ago from France. And you're living between Lisbon and Canada, right? 
That's right. So we also have a home in Canada where my oldest um, son and grandchildren are and visiting Scotland very often where my youngest son is. Amazing. And uh, we have Anita in the chat saying that she's joining from Canada. So there you go. You can uh, swap some tips and maybe meet up for dinner after this. <laughs> that is our plan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. Um, so, I mean, obviously already just talking to you in terms of where you're born, your origins, where you live is already so many places are appearing, right? Um, and I know that career wise, you've also traveled a lot and lived and moved to different countries. So can you tell us a little bit more about what you did, what you do in terms of career? And also I'd love to hear, you know, did you pick that path because you wanted to travel and find a path that allowed you to do that? Or did you just, randomly kind of fell into it and got to travel and move abroad a lot. Um, so Philippe, let's start with you on that one. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I'm an English teacher and I also teach intercultural cultural communication. So my background in terms of my studies is international relations, globalization, but also languages and literature. So I've always been uh, interested in different cultures and I've always wanted to travel. I started traveling when I was only 11 with my folklore dancing club in Macedonia. So I visited several countries when I was quite young. And I think that that was the moment when I realized I really want to do probably even have a job that will be related to traveling and having different places to be able to visit and so on. And um, I think that um, this was maybe my first idea when I was younger, but then being an international Uh, communication, uh, intercultural communication sort of teacher and coach and also working on different international projects, it has really allowed me to travel quite substantially. I could say I've lived uh, for a longer time in the United States, also in a bit of time, a bit more time in Germany that I've spent in Berlin, uh, 12 years, a bit more than 12 years in Paris. So I think this was definitely a uh, one of the most important period of my life that I've spent there. But I would like to say that um, I don't think you really plan how this will eventually uh, develop um, as the time passes by, but I do enjoy my job allowing me to travel. Um, I'm an English professor, as I said, I teach at the uni, but I also founded my own Institute for International Education and Culture, uh, which um, basically organizes different types of language and cultural trips for youngsters, most likely uh, students who are 15, 16, 17, and 18 years old. So basically teenagers, but this also allows me additionally to travel uh, mostly in the Anglophone world, but in general, and this is one of my personal passions, I think. That's so amazing. And we met actually in Bordeaux when you were living there and studying there. And this is now, what did we say? Is it 12 years, 13 years? <laughs> Long time. Uh, 2008, so it's 14. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Are we that yeah, old? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're just smarter or more intelligent to some extent. Wiser, wiser, that's it. <laughs> so what about you, uh, Nima? Tell us a bit more about uh, career-wise and, and all the traveling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, in reflecting on that, Selena, I want to really acknowledge my father because when we were very young, still in East Africa, he um, really believed that travel was the best education. And it's only now, in hindsight, that I understand his wisdom. And my earliest memory was him taking us to Japan, to the first um, uh, big fair there in Osaka. And um, so travel has been in my genes, I think. Um, and life took us to uh, Switzerland at the age of nine because we had to leave East Africa and then to the UK, Scotland, my parents were in Iran for a while. And so even my early childhood was defined by travel and uh, continental, I mean, we've moved continents, it wasn't even just within a particular country. And so career-wise, I don't think I consciously chose roles because of travel, but the more I think about it, every role that I had, bar two years as a teacher in a, in a school, um, involved travel um, and visiting either different places in the UK when I was a consultant. Um, even as a coach, I would go to my clients and sometimes the work I did would involve me going. And my last job before I started uh, my own coaching, again, coaching work again, 
um, was as a global executive director of a school system across 13 countries. So visiting and traveling was actually a very, very significant part of that role. But to be honest, I feel now ready to say, okay, people will now come to me. I'm staying put <laughs> just for a while. But I think my family might say, mm, won't be long before the travel bug gets her again. <laughs> um, so yes, I didn't consciously choose it, um, but it's been um, a theme running through my life since I was very young. It's, it's absolutely amazing between the two of you, just thinking how many countries, you know, you've been to, you've lived in and explored. So, um, and that's why I obviously asked uh, the both of you to, to come and talk to us about, about home. And we're going to get now into the, a little bit more of the depth of that topic. And we've talked about a lot of different places in those answers already in terms of just covering, you know, what, some of us might think or it's quite simple right where you were born where do you live you know and a lot of people will be the same answer right but obviously your answers are very different and so I'd love to ask you do you think that you can have multiple homes or just one home let's start there Nimet what do you think um so what came to mind right now uh, is in our moving from France to Portugal. It's interesting from an admin perspective, people ask you about your maison principale. Even in our system, there's something about a main home. And when we were deciding to be in both Canada and here, so this is where we live physically, um, slowly, we still feel there is a base, like a home base. But when we're in Canada or when we're in Scotland in my younger son's home, it feels like home too. So um, for someone like me being pinned down to one thing or one place does not feel comfortable. So I would say, absolutely, you can have many homes. You may not own many houses, but for sure, I believe you can have many homes. And that's the beauty of the English language of having those two different words, house, mm -hmm. the physical building mm -hmm. and home. Uh, and, and that's, yeah, just fascinating because I don't think that, for example, in French, uh, we were talking about this earlier. I don't think we quite have that equivalent word for home. You know, we have maison, which is house, uh, but for home, it's like chez soi, it's at, at yours. It is, there's not quite, so it's fascinating about the English language having that, that word home. And so, so Philip, um, do you think we can have multiple homes? Yeah, before I answer this question, I also just want to say, as, as Nimet said, I completely agree with her concerning, I mean, uh, referring to what she was saying about how education is actually uh, related to traveling or how traveling is actually education. I really think this, and I think that's why I really give or try to give as many opportunities to my students to travel. I think you learn the most by visiting places, meeting people, and also breaking stereotypes, uh, exploring, and so on. So by exploration, I think you also find out, I think, I believe this my humble opinion that you do have multiple homes, at least several, if not hundreds, obviously. But um, it seems like it's important for you to feel home um, uh, in the sense of, let's say it can be a physical feeling of having a house, having a, an apartment. Um, I can give you a, a small personal example since I own my own apartment uh, a while ago now. It's been uh, in Rennes, where I live now. I feel like I own a house, yes, and I feel like at home, definitely, by making it my own, um, by decorating it or by making it my own personal space. But definitely, if I have to think of my uh, place of origin, my country, Macedonia, my native country, definitely, it's one of my very important homes, Paris, will always be my home after spending almost one third of my life basically there. Uh, and also New York, where I did my studies, uh, one of the most, I guess, most beautiful, most amazing cities in the world as well. So I think these three places, Copia, Paris, and New York would be considered 
to me, for me, as places that I can call home. Um, I think home is more a feeling. You're right to say that when we talk about a house, an actual physical place versus the feeling of home. And I think to whatever home you go at some point, whether you're in New York, in Paris, in Skopje or in, um, in Rennes, I think one can feel um, someone is missing or something is missing because we basically in this kind of sense, having several homes mean, means that you always are in between worlds to some extent. Is the home a world in which we live? Is this something that has boundaries? Do these boundaries actually shift? Uh, can they actually change, be modified? I think it's all about how you perceive this very philosophical or sociological question. I believe that having multiple homes would be probably more advantageous in many cases and feeling like being at home, whether it's a city you just love where you go during the summer can also in a way be homey for you. It doesn't have to have a very strong relation to your job or your business or your studies. And I think it's all about your personal perception, but I do believe that we own um, let's say in this sort of like philosophical uh, sense, uh, several homes in our lifetime. That's fascinating. You've covered so much ground in that. And I think we'll like unpick and, and dive into different, different elements. And I can really relate to some of the things that you're saying around, um, you know, when you're, you're looking for uh, for for home and finding multiple homes in different places. Um, and, and we'll touch on that. I think for me personally, when I started, you know, living abroad and I was looking for home, desperately trying to find this place it, in my mind at the beginning, it was a place. It was like, where is home? Where is that place that I feel like I belong, that I feel like I can be myself? Um, and, and looking for it gave, all, you know, in different countries and around the world gave me that feeling of at times belonging everywhere and at the same time belonging nowhere. Uh, and so Nimeta, I'd love to turn to you and, and ask you uh, a bit of reflection on that. You know, is home a place? Uh, is it? Is it not? And if not, then what, what is home? Mm -hmm. It's such a beautiful question, Solène. And I'm sort of being taken to myself at nine years old, where I left um, Africa and was in Switzerland just as winter was coming and remembering the experience of snow and how quiet it was compared to this noisy African rain. So as a little girl, it, what I noticed I did because I changed many schools over my life. I think I counted nine different schools. Um, so there's no continuity in my education vis-a-vis -vis a curriculum. You know, so there are gaps in my formal education, but not in other kinds of education. So what I found was how did I as a child and even then as an adult, because of this constant travel in my work and context, um, was I realize now that it was much more about um, what happened with people around me because that kind of stimulus of figuring out the external um, environment, culture, I think my focus narrowed very much into paying attention to people signals. Mm. So my home, my environment was around people signals, which is probably why the career I love the most is when I'm coaching people, because I pay attention to something um, deeper than the apparent. So for me, home now, um, and I know we'll come to it a little later in this conversation, has been about where am I most at ease? Where can I be most authentic? Where am I most safe? Where do I feel I can grow? Where can I experiment? Um, where can I love? Where can I allow myself to be loved? Um, and so these are very much the experiences that preoccupy me. And what I'm finding is the more I focus on those qualities, which I think as a child, an adolescent, and a young adult, I was trying to find, is it safe here to be myself? Is it safe here to love? Is it safe here to allow myself to be loved? 
so bumpy experiences, but it colored how I then experienced the exterior, whether it was a house, a school, whatever the roof over my head was. So I think for me, home and home now not being a house, but the space you're occupying, um, the country you're occupying. And, uh, and it's about the more I can know what that feels like within myself and creating that within myself. The interesting thing is that's what I then see and find outside myself, because then I will focus on that. So as a child, I'd focus on where is it safe, where is it safe, where is it safe? Um, and then I'd look for where the safety was, but then I excluded a lot of other things. So I think in all that travel, learning, I wish I'd been taught to find that anchor early on, then I'd have observed more and seen more. So um, I'm, I, I, it's, it's that I love, Philip, that you said it's at many different levels. I think home is, is dimensional. I think that it, we're, we live in many different dimensions. Um, and for me, that inner dimension now influences home, what, where, what feels like home in any given moment. And I also like being in my house because now <laughs> I get it to reflect what I feel I need insight. Yeah, the, you've covered so much ground in that because obviously you're talking about home as a place. Uh, your final point there about recreating that inside into the outside mm -hmm. world around you. You've mm -hmm. talked, touched on home being people, who's mm -hmm. around you and how uh, the interactions, the relationships, the interpersonal elements are. And then you've also touched about home being a, a feeling of mm -hmm. how you're feeling inside and finding and then creating, recreating um, that home inside so so there's a lot there and I love how you then summarized it in home is multi-dimensional um, mm. and I think the more I talk to people about this topic of home and I did a lot when I was writing uh, my my first book because I, I and actually my third one as well because I talked a lot about home I'm fascinated by this obviously uh, I talked to a lot of people and every single person had a different answer. Obviously it was like kind of on the fly question, I would ask people, you know, what, what is home to you or where is home to you? Some people would say a place, very factual. Some people would say where they're from or where they were born uh, or where they live. Um, some people would say a person, you know, my mm -hmm. partner, my family. Some mm -hmm. people would say their dog. Um, mm -hmm. Someone told me a suitcase. Home is my suitcase because I have everything I need in there. Um, but then some, a lot of people, a lot more people actually mm -hmm. talked about feeling home is mm -hmm. where I feel safe. Like you said, mm -hmm. home is where I belong or is, mm -hmm. home is where I feel loved, heard, seen. So a lot of those feelings and emotions. Mm -hmm. So, um, Philip, what, what about you? I mean, in terms of like, we're covering now, I think the, the whole dimension. So, uh, talking about people feeling within, how would you define your home on those dimensions? I think home is all about, again, going back to the perception and also where you come from originally could play a role as well. It's a cultural question as well. A lot of people would say, you don't need to own a home to say I'm at home. But a lot of people would say, well, I bought a house now or I have my own apartment. So it makes a difference. Myself coming from Macedonia, for example, that was a, um, in, in our tradition, in the Macedonian tradition, having even a small apartment or a small house is something that every normal sort of like, uh, let's say, uh, um, middle class or a lower middle class person would typical person would have so anyone can sort of like afford a home or a house of some sort so this was something that was a given but I think that uh, obviously uh, for me being French Macedonian today I have this cultural heritage or perception that home is also about having your own place that you really own it where you feel safe as Nimet said definitely where you have everything you need as a suitcase you mentioned so in terms of everything I need is where you know where I am at the moment but on the other hand people is um, the people who make you feel like at home can also be basically people who can call you or people can be part of a virtual chat like us today for example 
people. Um, their voice, their uh, beautiful presence, their importance to your life could bring something that might be missing at the moment that you might say, I'm at home, but I miss few people who would really make my, my home full or who would definitely bring the to the highest point what home is for me or where I feel safe, happy, content, and so on. I think it's a mixture of all these things. And as long as you feel good where you are, this place could be a home. It can be a physical place, obviously, but also it can be a place that is, is giving you a psychological piece of some sort too. Interesting points on the cultural point. I think obviously um, that's somewhere I personally would feel very different, right? There was no, um, I never, for example, for me personally, I would never think that it's important to own uh, a place I never actually thought I would because I thought I'd just live on the road across the world and COVID came and just changed all of that. It's interesting what you say about, you know, in Macedonia, it would be seen or considered normal, which is a word that I really struggle with, but, you know, kind of commonplace to own, to own a physical, a physical space. Um, and, and probably to be fair in a lot of countries, I think in, in France too, like climbing that property ladder is, is put as important. Um, but is that home? Cause you can own a, a physical building and yet perhaps you don't, feel at home um any thoughts on that Nimet in terms of you mm. can own but yeah I, I, I mean I think that we've uh I imagine uh as an invitation to all of us at least for me I have experienced being in the most beautiful places in the world and depending on how I was feeling on the inside being able to appreciate it or being in the most basic spaces and yet feeling awed by beauty around me. And I think the important thing, the biggest thing I've um, sort of realized for myself in reflecting on this lovely question you asked and having time to reflect on it before our conversation today, was that when I think about all my travels, I went to Central Asia, never been been there before my work took me there uh you know um, most of the different um countries in africa uh, southeast asia so i met people of many many different cultures and um there are times when i would feel so at home because of the level of connection we made and when you strip away the color of my skin, my accent, my gender, whatever it was, one thing that I, I think I can say it almost confidently feels universal that I've experienced is at the end of the day, when I could speak to the fact that we need to be seen and then chose to see, that people want to, we all, me too, want to feel valued, and understood so i sought to understand rather than make a quick judgment about that person or and shoulders drop bodies move forward faces relax and there's a look that exchanges which means ah we're home we found each other and for me if i can live whatever years are left to me in this body it's to keep finding that in the connections I make. Um, and uh, for me, that is the most profound place we find home is when we connect, because then we recognize it, right? We recognize it. It's beyond your name, your culture, your color, your height, your gender, your socioeconomic status, the language you speak, how you speak it. And um, this for me, I think, since I was very little, has been my search on where 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 is that thing in that person <laughs> how do we get to it mm. how do i find it how do i meet it and i think as i now the work that i'm choosing to do is to be in that space with people because it's the best gift i can experience for myself and i think it's something beautiful for others too 
So that's yet another dimension uh, uh, of work. So when that's happening, any physical space can feel home. I can have been in the most rural, deprived space physically, apparently, and had the most beautiful connection. Um, and I wouldn't trade that for a beautiful physical building in that moment. When the core speaks to the mm. core, mm -hmm. um, that exchange can create mm -hmm. the, the the space, the let's say um, mm. conceptual or or yeah um, mm, space of home in between two people. That's mm -hmm. that's beautiful. Without um, sharing, definitely. Yes. I'd love to. Space. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, obviously, so between two people, and also you're you're talking about um, you know within yourself as well, and we've talked about before a little bit, uh, both of you around feeling inside at home, and that could be anywhere. Um, can you tell us that will be our final uh, question before we uh, wrap up and and uh, speak to everyone who's joined us live? Um, can you tell us a bit more about that home within? when you have that feeling that you're at home, what does it feel like? What does it look like? Does it have a, I don't know, a color, a song? Is it, or is it just a feeling? Um, who wants to get started on that one? I can see thoughts on both of your faces. <laughs> well, Nimel can go first if she wants to. I'll be a gentleman <laughs> again. And I'll get one more minute to think. Okay, well, um... I know what I want that inner space to feel like. And I think if there's one thing in the last few years that caused me to take a decision to stop the work I was doing and fully immerse myself in the work of what I call the inner personal world. Because I'm realizing I live there, this inner world. I think we all inhabit that and then experience the world from there. But what I realized was I hadn't paid attention to what it was like in there. So I know what I wanted to be like. I wanted to be all those things I said for me home is safe, nurturing, loving. And so right now I feel I'm in a renovation period of my inner home. And um, I'm getting rid of things that are not allowing the sunlight to shine inside there and remembering to put beautiful things in there um, and so i feel that the potential for my inner home to be so um, welcoming from which i can greet the day is still in the making so i'm in renovation period <laughs> <laughs> but the, but the blueprint <laughs> and the uh, the plans are absolutely beautiful, but I'm working on it. You have and brilliant we, little architects and project managers inside. Oh, many. All many the many. work and putting all the colors <laughs> and all the things. <laughs> I love that, Selene. I think I'm not consulting them enough, but I will. <laughs> I'll hire some good ones now. <laughs> well, that's a brilliant metaphor. Um, so what about you, Philip? I think that the inner feeling is something or the inner feelings that we have for anything, including home, is very difficult to maybe linguistically explain. I think it's all about the feeling itself. And I, I think that uh, it's very often related to um, who you're sharing that space with. Going back to what we just mentioned previously, I think is if you share your place, if you share your house, it doesn't matter if you own it, if you share the home where you live currently or substantially for a longer period of time, um, if you share it with a person you love, you, you cherish, you respect, and so on, I think it would bring joy to you and I guess your inner peace. I think when I think of home, I think of safety definitely, but I think the, the one word I would choose is peace, feeling peacefully, being able to fall asleep, to wake up in safety. Uh, if I have to choose a color, let's say, because you mentioned maybe a song or a word, I think I would choose blue. My favorite color is blue. So I did decorate my apartment in many shades of blue, actually. So I think that blue for me is also another, uh, let's say, uh, metaphor for peace or something that mm, put, puts me at ease or puts me sort of like in a in a um, positive uh, sort of like a vibe feeling context in which I can thrive and definitely lots of light and sun. 
for me, when I think of home, I think of a lot of brightness coming from Macedonia, where it's very hot, basically, especially in the summer. Now it's too hot, even in Brittany and France, because of global warming, probably. It's all about feeling warm, warmth, if this makes sense. And I think uh, uh, people who live with you definitely bring these feelings uh, to you and you share them together. A lot of brilliant words in there peace warmth love joy um oh absolutely i i i felt them all so thank you thank you so much for for sharing both of you um we are going to wrap up this recorded uh part just now and then we'll open for questions and discussion uh with everyone who is here live so do uh, bear with me just a, a couple of final uh concluding remarks we wanted uh nimet uh, actually brought this up uh in our session when we prepared for this conversation the three of us really wanted to acknowledge the fact that uh the three of us our stories are stories of choice and privilege. Uh, we, uh, we know that there are many people out there, uh, whether it be refugees, homeless people, und undocumented people, who don't have a place, a physical space to call home, who um, are not safe uh, where they live or have not chosen the place where they're at. So we just wanted to acknowledge that and honor them through this conversation. And um, I hope that, you know, if, if anyone is watching this and is in this situation, if you're wanting to share your story, uh, um, I really hope to do more conversations about this topic in the future. So I would love to, um, to hear other perspectives and share them on this platform. Um, and then just to finally uh, mention a few words um, before we part ways is uh, um, just to share with you um, that we have um, future episodes coming up. Um, so on Thursday, 25th of August, we're going to be talking about inclusive innovation. Um, so that's going to be very different, interesting. Also, you know, I like to bring different topics. So very, very different uh, topic there. Um, that's going to be after the holiday period because I need to get married and take a rest and this is on the record <laughs> uh, in the meantime you can follow us on uh, instagram and facebook at be beyond borders uh, you can check out uh, my website which is uh, bebeyondborders.com and feel free to subscribe to the newsletter and also um, all previous episodes are on the youtube channel uh, be beyond borders so if you want to watch uh, any previous conversations that's where to find them and I will see everyone watching the recording uh, for episode 10. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Selene.